Okay, everyone. So, um, third time here uh, this year, we're talking a little bit more. Josh is once again um, inform me of some things that uh, I didn't know about, and now I can't sleep anymore. Um, so, uh, this, some of these slides are just for for anybody that needs the deck. But real quick, uh, I'm not an operator. I'm an automation professional um, and a professional engineer. So. Um, my job, I have a duty to protect the public. That's what being a PE means. I, my personal license is on the line for all the work that I do. Um, and where I focus is the, the, the area of operational technology. Some of you probably know it as ICS, industrial control systems, or automation, or not really robots, but it's all kind of the same, the same stuff. It's not IT. Um, I'm not a hacker, I'm not a cyber guy. Um, but I can certainly find the problems when those things occur. And um, as uh, three or four personality profiles have told me, I'm a challenger of basic assumptions. And that's probably why we get along so well. <laughs> um, I have four basic principles. One, there is no such thing as an accident. <clears throat> that is an impossibility. Someone has made a decision. Someone has put something in motion to cause an incident to occur. There is no such thing as an accident. People are the asset. So we talk about all these assets and da 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 da. Unfortunately, the finance people still haven't figured this out. <clears throat> Excuse me. On the balance sheet, you're all our liabilities. I never have understood that, especially if you're a consulting firm. When what you do is sell people, your people are a liability, not on the asset side of the equation. One of these days, they'll figure that out. Um, I'm really excited about cyber from the standpoint that it is the great unifier. Um, it is the one topic that every business division in any company has to get unified on or they're going to have a lot of problems, right? So I see that as a huge opportunity. And um, in my opinion, cyber is just one of many, 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 many risks that we have to manage every day. So I think one of the talks earlier was all about risk management. That's really what cyber is. All right, so let's get going here. Let's go on a journey. Let's talk about where we've been over the last couple of years, um, where are we and where we're going, um, and what can we do to change the path. So last year, year before, I think I threw this one up, um, just to give everybody an idea of just where is it that your water comes from, right? So, um, and, and how much we as humans impact that. Um, uh, if you're a climate denier, you know, I'm sorry, you know, science doesn't care what you believe. So the, um, the things are that, you know, snow, it's just a big cycle, right? We don't create water. There is no, like, some magical hand comes down and creates water. It's always in cycle. Um, and we contaminate the hell out of it with everything that we do, and we let the ground suck all the contaminants out. We put it back in, and it starts all over, right? So. Just as a, as a point, you know, as we run it through, water is one of the few resources we only use once. Now, there are some cities that are starting to get smarter about that, but if you think about it, when you flush the toilet, where does it go? Back into the river for the next city to suck in and process and ship out, right? But you've only used it once. Um, like I said, there are some cities that are getting a lot smarter. You'll see the purple pipes is a universal color for recycled water. Um, it's not treated enough to, well enough to drink, but it's well enough to water your grass, which is a concept I've never understood. <clears throat> um, so, also, you know, water's a utility, right? So, water, you think of, well, it's an electric system. Electric systems and, and water systems all have the same customer. Um, they both have meters on the facility. They've got some delivery device into the facility. Um, the difference is, is that there is no national grid of water, right? So I can't buy water. If I'm in Maryland, I can't buy water from L.A., um, from a wind farm or from a, a, a lake, right? So all your systems are local. So the water that you're drinking at home might not even be the same water you're drinking at, at work. Right? It might be two entirely different systems, which also means two entirely different sources. Um, when you get into water, there's, there's, you can pull water from rivers, you can pull it from a reservoir or a lake, you can pump it out of the ground. Uh, there's a lot of different areas. The, the failures that occur in those systems can, can 
wreak havoc, but it's localized, right? Um, let's think back not too long ago to, to uh, Jackson, Mississippi, right? Uh, completely shut down a town that was already uh, in bad shape. And uh, on the water side, we have to treat the, you know, the electrical guys, they just pump it to you, and then the electrons go off into the ground and you suck them back later, right? <laughs> Water, we got to do something with it. We can't just dump it on the ground. We got to treat it, and we've got to make sure that it goes back in a clean environment. So, has anybody really uh, anybody been in water industry or uh, complex manufacturing? So, let's talk a little bit about what an OT network might look like, or or a water network at a at a facility, um, and why this problem is so complex. So this is just a, a high level, very high level view of all the different systems that exist at a water uh, utility. Um, there's a lot of point solutions. The, the, one of the challenges that water utilities have are they don't have the money or the expertise to go out and buy SAP that combines a bunch of stuff into one database, right? They end up with a ton of little point solutions. So your customer data might be sitting you as a billing, as a receiving a bill, that might be sitting in one database, but the data about the meter on the side of your house is in another database. The pipe that's going into your house is going to be over in another database. Um, you know, it just it, it's just a, a hodgepodge of, of information. And as I'm sure we all understand, right, what happens when we have all sorts of different pieces of data all sitting floating around out there, it increases our attack surface, right? Did I get that right? Yes. All right. <laughs> so, um, and, and the other challenge that I see in the water industry is we've got a ton of vendors coming in and say, oh, you know what? I'll improve your billing by 10%. Um, give me all your data and I'm going to pump it up to the cloud. And now, I got, now you've got a connection to the cloud. Um, a lot of utilities are moving to um, uh, smart meters. Great stuff, right, smart meter. Um, did you know that I can tell if you have a prostate cancer issue from your water meter? If you flush a toilet a lot at night, in the, when you should be sleeping, generally somebody has some kind of an issue that we're dealing with. Um, that The water utility doesn't own that data. When they hire a badger meter or somebody else, they give up the right to that data. So it's kind of like the the Facebook metadata stuff, right? Or the, the uh, NSA and the metadata, right? You, you don't know where that data is going. So, um, you know, that's what it is. Uh, on the OT, so if that was the overall network, the enterprise network, on the OT side, this is a pretty good example of the challenge that we've got in a water system is similar to an electric system in that it's a geographic nightmare, right? It can it can span for hundreds of square miles. I've got might have a pumping station on one side of a mountain that I got to talk to back to the the main where the water source is, and I've got to pass all that stuff through. So again, attack services are are everywhere. I got, you know, a, a lot of these networks are so old. You know, there are 450 megahertz radios out there talking to each other. Guess what? <laughs> when those things went in, there wasn't a thing as such as encryption. <laughs> You got to have a lot. You got to really try to to get onto the network, but it's possible. Um, so again, a lot of stuff going on there. The cost of improving these systems ranges in the tens of millions of dollars to go in and, and swap this stuff out. Um, there's a lot of ways to do that, but you know, who pays more than? Know, let's throw a number out. Does anybody in here pay more than a hundred dollars a month for their water bill? Right, it's probably costing the utility two hundred dollars a month to deliver it to you. <laughs> but you know, you, we talk about raising the the utility fee by pennies, and everybody has a heart attack. So this is an area that's very underfunded and requires a lot of grants and things to make that stuff work. So replacing this stuff isn't in the isn't in the in the future. So there's a report um, came out. Uh, recently, 2012, that said, uh, hey guys, we have a problem 
in the, this was like at the beginning of all the infrastructure talks, right? Infrastructure week, da 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 da. Well, in 2012, the water industry came out and said, hey, we've got a trillion dollar problem. Forget about all the technologies. We're talking about the pipes in the ground. We've got to get out and replace all the pipes in the ground that were only supposed to last 60 years, 50 years. They're now approaching 100 years. There's still pipes we're digging out of the water, out of the floor, out of the ground in New York City, some of the bigger cities that have been around a little bit longer that are wooden. Um, cast iron. Everybody remember Flint, Michigan? All the lead problems, right? So that problem has not fixed itself. <laughs> um, and it's only getting worse. So keep that in mind as we talk about a few other things. So I say cyber is barely on the radar. If you look down at you know computers and, and workstations and cyber and uh, Cisco switches and things like that, they're all on these cycles, right? When you get into IT, you get budgets for that stuff. Um, you know, who's working on a laptop that's all older than four years old, right, from your company? Um, I can tell you that I readily go in and assess control systems. You know, you get to do your email on a four-year-old machine, but you're running your plant on an NT box that might, might be under 10 years old, maybe. Um, so we've got this huge disparity between the, the control systems, the brains of the entire operation, um, and some of the stuff is so old it won't run on anything else. So now we, we've got to keep things alive based on eBay. Um, but more importantly, the 60-year-old stuff, the stuff that's in the ground, the pipes, we haven't been able to figure out how to replace that. I, I remember having a conversation with one uh, surprisingly large city, and they were ex talking about, oh, yeah, we, we're replacing 10 miles of pipe a year. And so I was like, okay, so you've got like, there's like 3,800 miles of pipe. I was like, so 10 miles is gonna be, it's like, correct me if I'm wrong, but the pipe is gonna be obsolete before you get back around to replace it again. It's like, you know, I'm not a mathematician, but you know, I know how to use Excel. So this stuff is going on all the time. And unfortunately, there's just a lot of competing competing folks in the in for the money, right? And then this is the other one that has cracked me up. So I, I entered the water industry about 2014, and you know, I was all excited about how everybody talks to each other and they do these surveys and everything. So this was the most recent survey from 2021, and I, I should have found the one from 2014 because it's identical. I, well, I mean, they, they move around, but they never change. Right? They never say, hey, my God, cybersecurity, big problem. Well, until I started talking to Josh, big mistake. <clears throat> um, so each year it's the same list, only it's in a slightly different order, right? And it, it kind of, I, I started to call it the fad list because it's just like whatever everybody kind of thinks is the issue is what shows up. There's not really a whole lot of analysis. Um, so since our last meeting, there's been a few things going on that have been pretty exciting in my mind. We had some presidential strategy coming around around um, a call for the EPA who, if you didn't know, the EPA goes out and inspects every water system. It's a sanitary inspection, sanitary survey. They go out to every water system. Um, I think it's on a yearly basis. might be every other year. Um, just to make sure that things are in good shape, right? Um, they're checking for that you're doing your samples correctly and, and your equipment's working and stuff. So brilliant idea. Let's call, let's use that same resource to go out and also do a quick assessment on the cybersecurity posture of these, of these facilities. So that got shot down by the water industry because we don't want anybody coming in and telling us what to do. A um, lot of internal arguments going on about that. Um, I, I don't quite understand why. Um, you know, to me, it was something we could start to work with it. At least it was a good framework. The people inside the water industry have been asking for something like this for a long time, but we decided to shoot it down. Um, our friend, the Volt Typhoon. Thank you, Josh. Another thing I was very happy not knowing about. Um, that was been revealed. Um, does everybody remember the little pump attack on the Israeli pumps that came out a little while ago? We're going to use that as an example here in a little bit. Um, that's been new. And um, 
I'll I'll re- defer to Josh for this one because I don't know a lot about it. But this is where some of the the current thinking on uh, that's really got me engaged about the cascading failures, right? Um, so we'll we'll use that here in a little bit as well. Um, CrowdStrike. So everybody remember? Well, I don't know. It's a lot, it's, <laughs> so there's a few folks in here that might not know this, but everybody, how many people remember the old saying, you never got fired for hiring IBM? Yeah. Right? We're going to go out and get CrowdStrike because they're the best. And we'll be protected, right? So Ira was talking about earlier about open source, um, how you know he doesn't understand why people don't understand open source. I understand it fully. I can't sue open source. I can't transfer liability to open source. Well, if I'm the general manager and I'm trying to figure all this stuff out and my insurance company is wanting to know what the hell we're doing for cyber, ah, we got CrowdStrike. So, you know, diversification of, of vendors, I think, is a very important um, problem that we've got to start dealing with. Um, and then I, I do agree with Ira's hockey stick thing. Dragos, CrowdStrike, they're not out there to do cyber. They're out there to make money. Let's just be honest about it, right? So, um, and then this whole concept of cascading failure across sectors, um, we'll do a little bit of exercises on that here in a minute. So, um, is everybody following this this concept? Any questions yet on your where your water kind of shape your waters in before I roll into some exercises? Does everybody know your, where your water comes from? Is it wells or aquifers or a lake or a reservoir? You know what plant it's coming from? You know how old your pipes are? This is all publicly available information. You can go and ask for it. Okay, well, we'll keep on rolling then. Ready for the, the audience participation? Did I cover everything? Keep going. Okay. So let's get into some of this. What is a cascading failure? Anybody? Don't look. Right. One failure happens to the next one into the next one, right? Just keeps, like, uh, what's another word for it? The dominoes, right? Boom, 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 right? So one failure triggers another failure, triggers another failure, triggers another failure. So let's do a little example. We'll pick an easy one. Um, oh, I should have coordinated this and turned the lights off at the same time. Rats. So power goes off in this hotel right now. What did, what's the next thing that happens? What do you think happens? What was that? Generator comes on. But what's the generator going to run? Well, no, I'm sorry. The generator is really just going to power the life safety type stuff, right? Some, some of the lights, not all the lights. I bet the AC is going to turn off, right? But it's going to control enough stuff that ensures the safety of people, right? That's all the requirement is. I don't, you don't have to keep the cash register on, although I'm sure they do here. <laughs> <laughs> That's life safety to them. So you kind of get that, that process, right? So the generator comes on. What do you think else is going to happen? All right, there's going to be something happen with people, right? Do you think there... I'm sorry? Everybody's going to turn their flashlights on. So there's going to be a little bit of confusion, right? Everybody's going to try and figure out what's going on. Where are they? Um, is anybody going to panic? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Is it rational panicking? Maybe. Maybe. Especially if you're in the bathroom, right? And it goes totally dark. <laughs> what else? Air conditioning is going to stop. What's it going to do in here when it's 112? Did it finally, where are we right now? Yeah. When it's outside, how long are we going to be comfortable? So, I can keep asking, what else is going to happen? Elevators. Throw them out here. Elevators will what? fail. Elevators will stop. Elevators will likely stop. And that makes sense, right? If they're supposed to, you're not supposed to use an elevator in a fire, so it's kind of the same thing. 
Do you think there's going to be any notifications that go out? Maybe. Just, I bet the fire alarm. I bet the fire alarm will probably call out, right? And say, hey, I've lost, we've lost power. Um, we'll need help of some kind. Maybe let's say it's a, a long outage, right? So it's longer than longer than a day. Yeah. I doubt you're. They're gonna let. I doubt anybody's gonna let somebody sleep in a 112 degree room, right? So yeah, there'll be a pretty big mass evacuation. So can we all say though it's gonna be pretty controlled? I mean, there's there's no real life threatening emergency going on, right, at the hotel, uh, unless somebody gets trampled for a mass panic or something, right? What was that? I, I'm sorry. The hotel doors may or may not open. Oh, yeah. Well, um, and, and in fairness, there's a mechanical piece to that, right? They all have breakaways. So I don't know if you noticed that, but every every one of those doors will break away. So. I would argue that there is, in fact, potential for life-threatening issues. Because if you have people who are on insulin, if you've got people attending this convention or in their rooms and they have insulin and they lose their fridge, they're going to need to go to the hospital or they're going to die. Right. Interesting. So we might have all of a sudden a real supply problem, right? All of a sudden, a bunch of insulin that's in the in these refrigerators is going to go bad. Well, they got to go replace that from somewhere. Great. Sorry. Now that you mentioned that, thank you for the fridge. I was going to say you have all the you have all the restaurants here. You have everything that depends on. So all that food's going to spoil. Not to mention the casino. Uh, you know, they'll lock up the trays, so there won't be any more income coming in so thanks. good yeah but yeah everybody's got kind of want their money back on their machines that are right i won this what happens that could be turned into a panic attack <laughs> as as someone who lives in houston <laughs> and spent nine days in july without power in our area deregulation is finest um although in all fairness i have a whole house generator so my house is air conditioned but here's all the little things that people bring it up there's a myriad a ton of disassociated that cannot be centrally managed issues the city can manage some things traffic lights the city can manage some things getting gas to gas stations the city can't manage insulin people going to the er the city can't manage all sorts of tons of different things and so one thing trips off a wide variety of unmanaged events and there's where your little plant? mess becomes he was he's not a plant okay <laughs> you had one you know, i was gonna say well, first first nine days is a really long time yeah um, but i mean like i I've, I've lived in new york city for 20 some years and we had a blackout in 2003. Sorry, I was going to say I lived in New York City in 2000. Like, when the big brownout th happened. There was a big blackout, blackout in 2003. Yeah. The city did not panic. I mean, everyone kept their cool. Granted, the power went back on about six hours later. You know, the, the stores were giving away ice cream. You know, it was kind of a carnival atmosphere. It was a nice sunny day. Yeah. It wasn't like there wasn't a storm bearing down on us. Right. But the mass panic that you, you might envision, that doesn't really happen. We right. didn't have looting this time. We did in 77. But this time, eh, things, yeah. are, things are pretty cool. Now, nine days, that might be different. Right. Yeah. Right. Fair point. So, oh, yeah. This From is good. Lo local perspective? Yeah. So all the hotels are on solar grid that they went off the main grid. I think it was at four or five years ago. So they're on their own grid. They all pay for solar power. You'll see them out in the desert. Uh huh. Different places. Kind of a good idea. Also, we're a number one destination, uh, terrorist city potential. So we have systems. You got a lot of number ones space. going on here. <laughs> um, so in a regular place, yes, very much. But even and then, and then as far as people panicking, how many were at DEFCON last year? How many were at the bomb threat last year? Like, no one panicked. Everyone was just like, okay, I'm going yeah. to leave. So what you'd also would see immediately is there's a lot of plain clothes officers. There's also a um, fire station on the strip, uh -huh. which would immediately all go into an act until they know it wasn't a terrorist event. Great. You're all falling into my web. <laughs> Sorry, Come on over here. 
So um, I think it's fascinating and worth punctuating that it, dem- it really matters how long the downtime is. So we can usually have a downtime tolerance and a recovery time objective, but most of these infrastructure plannings are not really thinking through how bad it can get. And then on the solar panel thing, I'm going to call an audible and give this to one of our future speakers. <laughs> so for one hotel, fair enough. There might be a backup generator for the rest of them. The way the grid is set up around the, the strip, there's small pockets of microgrids that would kick in for maybe four hours. Right. Um, but other than that, the solar can't actually, this is one thing that's actually caused fights and riots in other cities, is people believe that their solar is going to give them backup generation. They were missold it by a whole bunch of installers over the years. I'm going to get murdered for saying this by someone. Um, but yeah, they, they, they missold it over the years. And so people started to believe they'd spent all this money on backup generation. And it was actually just a solar plant that couldn't do it. So um, there's this interesting feature of renewable energy that's also creating riots during outages, which is fun. So China, it's all <laughs> China. It's all made in China. Yeah. <laughs> so some, what are some common themes there? So the, the, the duration of the outage matters, right? Um, how impactful it is to, to life, um, it matters. Um, size, like area. size. <laughs> I won't say that. <laughs> Can we get in trouble for stuff like that? Yeah. No, okay. True, right? I, I passed through something at the airport that says if it happens here, it happened here. The question of how long is it known now? That's a great point, right? So when it initially happens, there's a bunch of people who get deployed to start figuring that out, but that's, you know, that never really gets out there. It's like sitting at the gate. It's like, what's going on now? So for the folks on the video, the statement that Art made, which was very oh, I'm profound, sorry. Yes. is that when the event happens, while you're in the event, you don't literally know the duration of the, of the event. Right. And people get mad, generally, when they don't have a planning horizon because they don't know if they should stay or they should go or if they go, where should they go? Yeah. Yep. That's a great point. And the, the other part that I'm not sure is a little more, more difficult to pick up on. And, and Josh has educated me on this. The other thing that we're relying on there is that the people that we're relying on aren't living the same norm thing that we're living, right? So the firefighters have a place to go that has electricity and air conditioning. The hospitals, all those folks have a place to go and come back to work and help us out. You had another point? We believe that. We believe that. The city of Houston found nine fire stations in which the backup generators weren't even installed. Weren't installed. <laughs> so they were there. So repeat that in Houston. So the, the, uh, what he was saying was that the city of Houston discovered nine, nine fire stations had physically had generator, but it wasn't installed. Okay. Perfect. I would say a big component is regulations in the city that The regulations in the city you live in. Yeah. Really? Okay. So you got to repeat it. So, damn. So uh, the, the regulations in the city you live in can also impact this. In the case of Vegas, it, air conditioning is fairly important. Hey, um, one thing who people who won't have power is the linemen or line workers' families is usually one of the more interesting. If the whole city was out, the people that actually need to come and probably fix something and check what's gone off generally also have families who will be stuck with nothing and so we're getting there distracting now the customers. web is starting to get bigger so yes i don't think i've heard it first thing i want to do is look at my phone and see if i have a signal because if i have no signal that means to figure out actually just to so the first thing the first thing that might lead to some panic is whether your cell phone still has coverage right so whether the tower is still alive so how big is this outage Kind of to add to the 
the point of person over there that mentioned it and the regulation is um, this past winter had a outage on the coast in Oregon and one of my coworkers with their solar that they were promised would work during the outage, which was about a week, found out as soon as power went out that the converter wasn't set up to flip over to the backup, <laughs> but it had never been tested. And I, I think that kind of goes yeah. to a lot of the points of, yeah. uh, there's no testing in a lot of it. Right. Good point. So a false sense of security. All right. So I'm weaving a web here. So let's take in a different scenario. So let's talk about the Cyber Avenger attack. So some pump controller, I, I could care less where it was made. Um, I couldn't care less where it was made. Um, so let's just say some device. I think we talked a little bit about that with the tractors earlier. Some device is out there, right, that somebody's embedded some software into, and they decide one day they wake up on the wrong side of the bed and they turn it all off. In the OT world, the common, well, the, the, the best thing that we normally do is we just start replacing stuff. So let's say this is a, a CrowdStrike level controller. So everybody's got four, two, one, whatever. So these things fail. We can probably get by. There's portable generators, portable pumps. Um, the water industry's got a lot of backups. So we can probably throw something in there for a little while. But we need to replace this controller. So we're going to call who? We're going to call the person that gave it to us, right? Installed it for us. So they're going to need. OK, so now I got this all of a sudden, this tiny little company that probably doesn't have you know, who knows where they're made, they, but all of a sudden they're going to get hit. So the, we're talking supply chain. So let's start thinking about what happens in a supply chain around something like this. So are they going to have 100 of these things? Are they going to have 2,000 of these things sitting around? Most likely not. Well, and, and, and be, so the lead time on stuff like this is generally weeks. Um, you know, thanks to our friends in the automotive industry and just-in-time manufacturing, there's not a lot of spare inventory laying around. Um, a lot of times when we do capital projects, one of the line items in the capital project is to supply the project with spares, critical spares. Um, I am shocked at how many times it actually doesn't happen. That money ends up going somewhere else in the job, and the shelves are bare. Yes, sir. I think you had commented earlier, like this might be a small company, maybe they don't have a whole lot of customer service reps. Uh, this leads potentially to an information vacuum, at which point malicious people might start taking advantage of the situation. Yeah, yep. <laughs> now, I know this is a hypothetical, but if I recall that compromise or quote, Scare quotes hacking was a password of one, 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 one. And couldn't we assume that if it's replaced by the same manufacturer that they, the new replacements also have said flaw? Information vacuum. Do we even know at the time, did we even know what it was, right? We just knew that this thing was acting up. And this, I, if I recall right, this actually didn't cause any damage. This was a a uh, threat that came up, and I think one utility or two utilities actually had a problem. I want to bring you back to your earlier slide about how many little water companies there actually are. This is not dealing with big water companies. This is dealing with literally right there, 151,000 different water companies. How many of those, and this is a question for you because you've been there, would they even know what sub and what year installed that stuff so do they even know who to call do they even know they of, have a problem exactly short of oh it's not working now i have to go get someone like your company to come out and figure out why it's not working right and it's kind of like when air conditioning season starts anywhere in the country <laughs> hvac <laughs> companies are point. like ka -ching. that's a great point so anyway, what I was trying to do here, think of also the, the toilet paper crisis, right? There was no real toilet paper crisis, but we sure as hell manufactured one, <laughs> right? And out of, out of what? 
What did somebody else have a sorry that you in a blue shirt? Yeah, so so I, I actually now that that's become one with the the pump controller is the pump controller. So with the pump controller, if that's the one model that's everywhere, then everything that's in stock is also that one model, which means your supply chain problems yeah. just it, your supply it, chain's it, junk, it's just, right? It is is gone, which right. means you have to go back to manufacturing, right? Uh, and redesign something or or whatever. Come and then workarounds. And, and then the issue with the the paper, the toilet paper. Um, most it, th there was plenty of toilet paper. The problem is it was in the wrong format, because they had uh, m uh, the the toilet paper that went to corporate locations. Was 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 in excess. They had Big way giant too much yeah. of it. Yeah. But the toilet paper for home use was was there wasn't an, there was actually a supply issue. Right. Because of where people were using it. Yep. Yep. So just trying to get us to think a little bit about supply chain. So first, the first scenario was thinking about the the people and what you know is going on in your world. This one's a little bit about supply chain. So guess what? Let's bring them all together. So City of Las Vegas, uh, a smarter presenter would have looked this up before the presentation. Uh, I know there's a city, the city has a, a, um, one major uh, utility, um, but let's just say that the whole thing fails. Now, how could it fail? Funny you should ask. So um, again, Vegas probably isn't as bad, but let's pick, maybe I should have picked a different location, but if, if somebody were to get into the controllers in the ICS system and hit everything with a water spike or a water hammer, does everybody know what that is? Water hammer. So if I am, uh, if I change the direction or the, the velocity quickly in water, it creates something that it's basically the sound, the speed of sound and it moves through the water pipe in a, in a spike. Um, and it generally sounds like somebody's hit the pipe with a hammer, water hammer. So you can hear these things in manufacturing that happens all the time. Well, if you've got a pipe that's 70, 80 years old, it was only supposed to be in the ground for 40 years old, and you hit it with a spike that might be two or three times its design capacity, brittle equipment, over design pressure, what might possibly happen? Poof, right? Worse than that, it's probably going to go poof in multiple locations, not just one, because a spike rolls through the whole system. So that's the water hammer, right? So everybody learned a little process today. They'll be on the test. <clears throat> Lock the door. Um, so what we've got to do then is say, okay, well, how big of a deal is it to create something like that? Well, I could use a pump controller if I'm flowing and I'm keeping pressure. Um, average water pressure at somebody's house is about 60 pounds. Um, 45 to, to 80 is kind of what the rules are. Um, but let's say we hit that thing and, or we can stop a pump, we can stop a whole system. So going from 60 pounds to zero or zero to 60 pounds, either way can cause a problem. It's gonna be a lot easier to stop it. So we could stop it, we could close a valve and send the shock wave through the system. Um, either way, we can create some pretty big problems, right? So so I don't want people to think that this isn't something that can, can happen. This is something that can happen. There's a lot of, lot of equipment in place to keep these things from happening. We, uh, we put devices on valves so that they, they close very slowly, regardless of what the control system's doing. Um, so there's a lot of mechanical things in place, but it can happen. So let's just say we, we take out a couple of the big mains um, that are feeding the whole system, right? Or we take out a couple of plants. So Josh has been wanting to talk about this for, <laughs> for weeks. So let's start down the process. So there is no water. Turn on the tap. We're all gonna have water for a little while. We're gonna be able to flush the toilet for a little bit because gravity is our friend in water, right? So you, the reason we put water towers up that's a direct pipe to your house. We don't control it, it just, however tall the tower is, that's how much pressure you got at your house, right? 
<clears throat> and then there's regulators throughout the system. So there's all those tanks are going to have to empty out. We're not going to be real. We're not going to be able to refill them, but somebody's going to be out there watering their grass in the middle of a water outage, and all that water is going to go to the, somewhere it's not needed because we don't, you know, it's America. We don't tell people what to do, so we don't control that stuff. So a couple of days, maybe maybe we get by for 24 hours. Let's just say that we get by for 24 hours, and now we now the, you turn on the water faucet and it's done. What happens next? So you don't have water at home. You don't have water at the office. Who else doesn't have water? Restaurants. Restaurants don't have water. So you, electricity's still on. So the food in the fridge is okay, but you can't wash it or clean up or anything. Fire hydrants don't have water. Guess what? Your fire hydrants, guess where they're fed from? Same place as your house. I got one for you, Dean. Sir. Uh, the data centers that need about five, gil well, five million gallons a day, <laughs> there's a couple of major hubs here. Those, those, can't, those servers can't run without water. Uh, agreed. Uh, Yes. I will just make it simple. Yes. So data, so with this uh, concept of losing your tower might be a real possibility. My Water dentist cooling. office will close. Why would your dentist office close, David? Because without water, the nice person can't spray water into my face <laughs> as they clean my teeth. Okay. Fair. So they'll close. Yeah. And my teeth will not be clean. That and that we don't want that. No. Airport's gonna shut down. You can't run an airport without an air crash rescue without fire trucks. And if fire trucks don't have water, they can't make foam. And if you don't have a fire department, you can't run air commercial airplanes. What would happen here at the hotel? We'd all cook. No AC, no restaurants. No AC, no restaurants. No fire protection? Are you going to be able to occupy a building without fire protection? Yeah. Fire watch. With fire watch, but most people are going to want to check out and go where? <laughs> so that's not going to work. So where are they going to go next? Rent a car. Do you think there's enough rental cars here? Somebody said one word. It was a very important word. Started with an H. H. Hospitals. What, hospitals. Sorry, what? Hospitals. 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 So we can't run a hospital without water? <laughs> That's all right. We'll just put off all the elective surgery. Oh, wait, there's already patients in there. So all the people that were, we were relying on to help us evacuate from here, they don't have water either. Dehydration, population. Population, what was that? So we'll be able to use up some drinking water bottles for a little while, right? So Christian's pro hopefully gonna double click on this in his talk, but uh, not only does the hospital come to a screeching halt pretty quickly, but the or surrounding population gets dehydrated and needs medical attention. So decreased capacity combined with elevated required needs. Right. So now do you start to see this cascading failure scenario, right? So we won't have to belabor this much more. I think everybody sees where we're going with this. Um, and nobody's running for the hills yet. And, uh, I thought maybe it's not a good idea to build a city of, maybe it's not a good idea to build a city of a million people in the middle of a desert. Put that into your tourism commission there. Um, so anyway, the, this concept of cascading failure to me is a fairly new concept. Um, you know, we've all talked about our individual sectors having problems and what that does. I, I think COVID and some other things and some of the advanced thinking that Josh and his guys are doing has been pretty interesting around this. So um, 
just talking through some demand side users. So we lose the water plant, we lose our source of water. Residentials, are, you're no longer gonna be able to have potable waters or sanitary water. Commercial buildings, industrial energy, not gonna be able to make, necessarily make water or make uh, electricity for a while. Um, after, again, after a period of time, even the data centers, you know, they've got reserves, right? They're not making new water, but eventually those reserves are gonna evaporate. Um, it just, it just, it rolls down. So I wanted to show a couple of things. So domestic water use in gallons per day um, over here on the right. Um, Josh was very keen on this because of how this map correlates to other maps that are out there uh, and, and where these population centers are and how critical some of these, you know, there's critical infrastructure and then there's like critical infrastructure. So you've got this and, you know, you map that against uh, each circle here represents the size of water withdrawal by county. And this, I, I did this little one here just to give you an idea. So that's 2,100 million gallons a day. <clears throat> Does anybody put that in perspective? What a million gallons looks like? <laughs> Again, a smarter presenter would have put that together for you. <clears throat> But again, look at some of these dots, right? Look where they are. Obviously big cities, but also out in the middle of nowhere where you're doing a lot of irrigation for farms, right? So back to the agriculture and fruit production. So these things all start tying together. Yeah, look, 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 look at Southern Idaho, you don't really think of that much. Right? I thought that was interesting too. Yeah. Southern Idaho being yeah. all that down in there. Um, Wyoming, now we're into, now we're into our uh, geography part of the test <laughs> right so that, that I, I got to figure that some something to do with agriculture or our ranching farms you know those sorts of food production things yes sir so in the previous slide it had like Idaho Utah so so uh, yeah gallons per use per person per person yeah, okay, yeah, I was gonna say yeah. it, it's a lot less uh, populated in, right. in, yeah, I, yep. Yeah, yep. in that area. So. It's a little misleading. Um, you gotta really analyze it to pull the, the info out. Wasn't well, it overlaying the population growth? Yeah, well, I could do that, that'd be smart. Again, a better presenter. Yeah, that well, that, that's the percentages, oh. right? So the colors are the gallons per day per user, per person, and then the percentages are the change. Just had a question. Um, in this area, Clark County, everything indoors is recycled. So the hotels to the homes. So how affected are they by a loss of water supply? So this was back, uh, I think this graph was from 2015. So that's a recent development. And so that wouldn't have been in here. Okay, I was just curious. Yeah, no, that, you're right, you're right. That, and no, that's no, changing. I, mean, I, I didn't mean to challenge you. I wasn't oh, challenging no, no. I was asking how affected would we be by a loss of outside well, water again, supply? Most recycled water isn't reused for potable water. So you can use it to wash, flush the toilet, but you're not, you sh okay. most places you don't drink it. So good point, thank you. And that's, and that's where we're getting smarter, right? To make ourselves more resilient. Couple quick points. One, it depends on where the break in the pipe is. If it breaks in the pipe, even if you're recycling, you may not be able to get it back once you've sent it out because your in is broken. Yeah. And this was a lot of this is kind of interesting was covered in 2017 by a man named Michael Asante, who went and wrote a very paper that everybody hated, which said mega cities are set up to fail <laughs> because of the cross connection of all the intricacies. Yeah, everything. And basically, together. once things start to fail, you can't stop it. And that was not received well by any major government. And then just to kind of wrap all this up, so, you know, water isn't everything. Um, and I, I think that's the, the point here of this sector is there needs to be a better focus on it um, for a variety of reasons there's not. Sir. Just before you leave that last run there, um, one of the things I, I'm still trying to learn, I think this analysis of, like, consumption versus dependencies versus nexus with food or healthcare is really important. Um, and gonna be looking at that with the next 12 months or so. Yeah. The part I don't have a good feel for yet 
is if there are bursts underground, older pipes, <laughs> what is our best case recovery time? And, and that's for one city. But these types of laws are present in the supply chain for most cities, most towns. So how protracted could could this be and how would it be prioritized in its remediation? Depends on the, how coordinated it is, right? Um, I live in New York City and we have water pipe bursts like every two weeks. Um, it is a very common thing because right. pipes are very old. Right. Um, it's just something we deal it's with. It's accident. Though. Yeah. That's accidental. Um, yeah, yeah. It's just it, no, it's just because the pipes aren't replaced. Um, right. Until they break. Uh, but it's something we just live with. Yeah. So we've got about nine minutes left. Let me wrap up here and, and uh, get you moving. So my fears um, being in, in the industry, um, you know, the infrastructure is brittle, uh, both physically and in whatever the other word is. It just, it, it's, we're just in a really dangerous spot. Um, I believe that the attackers are already out there practicing and because we're not out there collecting this information, yes, we do have a water ISAC as well, um, but it, like everything else, is you know more of a hands-off. Um, so I don't think without any kind of centralized monitoring, you know, if you work for the water utility, you're probably not going to want to let the public know you've been hacked or you've got some problem, right? Um, you're already struggling to get every money, every penny of rate increase that you can. Now you're going to have to answer questions why you're not more prepared. Um, and I'm, my big fear is we're just burying our heads because the problem's too big. It's a giant elephant. You know, you got technologies out there that run the gamut of 40 years old to, to just bought this last year. It's a lot of problems to deal with. And we're also hiding behind insurance. Um, a lot of point solutions. Hey, we have CrowdStrike. Um, you know, so we look for a lot of point things that can take this off my plate. I can check the box when the when the survey comes out says, "Have you dealt with such and such?" I can say, "Yes, I have." Whatever. <clears throat> so for opportunities to engage, um, you know, stay. Please stay. Come back tomorrow. More solutions tomorrow. Um, I I like. Uh, I don't think we fully vetted it yet, but I like this concept. Josh came up with shields up or uh, or connectivity down. Um, I'm kind of thinking of, you know, I, I haven't been in state engaged in this group as much during the, the downtime that I've got um, when I'm not here. I'm trying to figure out how to stay engaged. Um, if there's a, a group of folks, you know, I'm thinking of things like the, the government does offer through CISA and NIST and some other groups and the labs to go out to these utilities and do surveys. Um, I'm thinking of what what we could do around that as well as doing some remediation not you know it's one thing to know you have the problem um, but that also presents its own problem um, you know attend your meetings your local meetings learn about your water systems what are they doing to about it um, chances are you might end up being the smartest person in the room on this topic uh, if you start to think about the workforce that we've got back when I started what I needed to know I needed to know something about PLCs, the HMI, the screens, uh, desktop computers, network switches, and some other stuff. Today, the amount of knowledge that that same person needs to know, it's not possible to exist in one person. However, we're still only hiring one person to do that job instead of five or six people that it really makes to do the job. So I'm sure that anybody's gonna, gonna need the help. Um, like I said, we do have a water ISAC. Uh, Again, it's the, the industry is very touchy about releasing this sort of information, and they'll hide behind a lot of stuff. And, um, and that's it. That's me. So if you have any questions uh, before or after, you can hit me on the email or uh, phone number. And I, I'm on the only social media I participate in is LinkedIn, um, and that's like once a week. <laughs> All right. All right. Please join me in thanking Dean.